Jonathan, welcome back. Um, it's really exciting to uh, to get to have another a ch another chat with you. Yes, it's great to talk to you. For the, just maybe we can tell the people that don't know, we had an amazing conversation like about a month ago or like three weeks ago, just before uh, the holidays. And uh, this usually never happens, but it glitched, and we just we thought it was recording, but it wasn't, and we were both devastated because it was a great it was a great conversation. Hopefully. I think we can we can can kind of move forward and and continue on and we'll able to capture some of it some of the best stuff that we had talked about. Yeah, um, I, I I did I did find the transcript for the first hour, so I think we're going to be able to maybe write an article to help people bridge the gap. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. So I was listening to a conversation that you had with Benjamin Boyce and James Lindsay, and James brought up a quote from. Uh, feminist theorist Kelly Oliver, which was the goal of theory should no longer be concerned with true or false. Rather, it should be concerned, concerned with strategic theories to achieve operational goals. And the chief operational goal is to, um, to escape the absolute sovereignty of a calcitrant nature. Mm -hmm. That one really rang for me because I think sometimes people who might be watching my work could be confused between like, why am I teaching people to go jump around in the city and then having conversations or in the, in the, in the nature and then having conversations with someone like you. But I think that's actually the fundamental root of what I'm trying of, of what drives me and that I'm passionate about is the sense that uh, we can't escape recalcitrant nature that yeah. are, there is no there is no us outside of its relationship to nature and yeah. i've been thinking a lot recently about um your talk at arc and that idea of how we align ourselves in a hierarchy of values that can actually give direction and meaning to life and then um an analogy that bishop baron brought up which is this idea that we, I think we've come to worship the idea of freedom mm -hmm. as the highest good. Um, but freedom isn't the highest good. And he, he talked about the idea that you want a kind of freedom that is not the freedom of to, to, a total freedom of action, right? To be able to do whatever you as the individual wants. You want the freedom that comes from being able to do what is your role virtuosically so yeah. i've been thinking about the guitar the analogy of a guitar right a toddler in some sense is total freedom of action with a guitar but it can't do anything with the guitar yeah exactly but if you if you um if you subsume yourself if you humble yourself if you take on the structure and you you in some sense enslave yourself almost to the guitar you apprentice yourself to the guitar and you learn the chords, you learn the notes, you learn the tunings, et cetera, all of a sudden you can express what the guitar wants to express. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I just want to say one thing about what you just said there, which is, which is, this is something that, for example, St. Paul understood really well, which is that, you know, you know, a lot of people talk about the idea of free free will, and you hear these discussions in the ra rationalistic space of, of you know about free will and whether it exists, whether it doesn't exist. But freedom for the, at least for the Christian theologian that I care about, was understood not as this, like you said, as this this complete freedom from all constraint. You know, that's a ridiculous thing. You know, there is no that is not something that we have access to, but. Freedom is only only happens when you you could say choose the good. That is the freedom we have, or to choose, or to go into the direction of that which is true. That is the freedom we have, and in some ways it's a it's a bit of a there's a paradox because in some ways you have to submit yourself mm -hmm. to the highest in order to be free from all the other principalities. So you be, you know Saint Paul says basically you become a slave to God. So that you be free of all the other things that enslave you, all the sins, you know, the, like the way that you're, because when you choose, like you talked about, like, just choose whatever you want, 
that usually that's a lie. You're not actually choosing whatever you want. You're secretly submitting yourself to some desire that is ruling over you in the moment. And mm -hmm. some, you don't realize it at first. You, you usually realize it once you play out the pattern a few times. It's like, oh, I'm free. I'm just going to drink, you know, I'm just going to drink until I pass out. And then you do that a few times and you think, actually, you know what? I'm being ruled by this thing. I'm not free at all. Uh, and that true freedom, like you said, is is the, the image of the guitar is the best, which is that you actually submit yourself to the guitar and to everything that it's offering. And in doing that, you become free within that attention, you could say, within that attention that you're giving to the purpose of of playing the guitar. But now scale that up to the highest, you know, then that's when you have this image of you you want to enslave yourself to the highest possible good so that all the other goods will lay themselves out properly and you won't be you won't be a, a slave to all these uh, um, small little tyrants that rule over us. When I was in my sort of most, in, well, <laughs> I, I wanted to say rational materialist worldview, but it, when I started to say that there was this little thing that said, well, that was actually a wounded worldview. There's something interesting about this, this sense that, that, um, that we can run to the rational mind to escape the pain and difficulty that's associated with uh, the rest of us, but it, it can be very deluding. I remember having these arguments with my wife when we were, um, you know, in our 20s, early 30s, where uh, I, I have more working memory than her. I have more facts on demand. I'm more uh, verbally fluid and I'm more capable of, of like creating a seemingly robust, you know, logical structure. And I would do that to her and she would get frustrated and upset and, un, you know, and, and she wouldn't be able to say it. And so <laughs> she said to me recently, it's like, I get it, Rafe. And I was like, oh, what you're saying is actually, I don't see through your logical inference system, but I completely disagree with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, th that's super interesting because in some ways that's also when you realize you know, that quote that you you made about the, the feminist uh, activist, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the, the weird secret about postmodernism is that in some ways they viewed the fault in kind of modern rationalistic mm -hmm. pro systems, which is that usually what we want is to aim towards a purpose and move towards that purpose. And sometimes we want to aim towards a purpose and get people to move towards that purpose with us, right? It's like we're going on family vacation. We need to mobilize the kids, mobilize everybody to kind of move towards that direction. Most of the time, the types of things we engage with, that's what we're engaging with. The kind of rationalistic analysis of something is useful to that, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, encompass the fullness of it. And so the postmoderns kind of understood that and these activist types understand that. And so they're filling, they're filling a... Um, like a gap in modernism, like, and that's why people are attracted to it because they're like, oh no, we do need to be moving towards transformation to be moving towards, yeah. you know, something better, like a, a, a higher good. Um, but the problem is that there's an objectivity to those goods. It's not, it's not a relative to whatever you want to make it. So if you want to, if you want to transform society into something that goes against nature in the proper sense, then you're going to create a, a monstrosity that will at some point self-destruct or will at least start to devour the thing, the people that that are involved in it. So, so, and, and this, it's interesting because I, I guess it's weird that you started with the conversation with James because James sees that. Like he's like, he doesn't like the fact that these activists, they're, they're using terms similar to what I'm saying. Like, you know, we need to aim towards a greater good. We need to aim towards something, towards goodness. We need to move in that direction. Uh, but the truth is that that's inevitable. We actually do need to do that. But th there is an, a real objective reality to morality that mm -hmm. isn't just whatever you want to make it, you know? So there's that. And yet it's um, ineffable. Of course. Right? It's, that, it's that's ineffable. the difficult move, right? We, because the rational mind doesn't like that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't want to accept 
that. You know, another conversation that I was listening to recently was um, John Vervecki's conversation with Ian McGilchrist and uh, and Daniel Schmachtenberger. And there was a, you know, McGilchrist's critique is this idea that that the 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 sort of rationalist worldview it actually arises from um, the left brain, uh, mm -hmm. the left hemisphere, and that that we know now for various neurological reasons that it's actually less capable overall. Mm. So that worldview, you know, <clears throat> it's obviously really powerful, right? It's it's sort of the worldview that gives us the technology that allows us to have this conversation. Mm. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> and yet there's, you know, I, I think a lot of what we were talking about in our last conversation was like, it's not working on some level to help us see things that are really, really necessary to see right now, like collective intelligences. Mm -hmm. I I remember the the atheist wars of the 1990s and early aughts, right? And I was very much on the side of like that. And it's a it's a conception of the world as the of the individual as an autonomous, um, rational agent. Um, and and there's no there's no respect for things above that, right? You yeah. you've been talking about the the principle of subsidiarity that that we have to see our identity um, not as not as adhering completely in us as individuals, but as being part of a fractal structure of being. <clears throat> There's a so so I'm 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 me, right? And I'm also my my wife's husband, and I'm That's right. my children's father. And I'm my mother's son and my brother's brother. And, and I'm, and I'm this person who teaches parkour and talks about weird philosophical stuff on YouTube, uh, to a lot of people now. Um, and then I'm part of a city and part of a nation and part of, uh, et cetera. And each of those, uh, each of those constrains me, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's lots of things that are now no longer available to me because I'm a married man. Um, and that that urge towards total freedom of action, it doesn't like that very much. But but without without the grounding of my relationship with my wife or of my relationship with my children, there's not any meaning to the actions. Right? It's like yeah, right. that's the guitar of my life. Yeah. And and that's interesting because what will happen if people don't realize that is that they will always be constrained mm -hmm. by something there is no way around that right even the logic of pleasure itself right and the cycle of pleasure yeah. and uh, is a is a cycle of constraint mm -hmm. and so the question is always what constraint affords the most yeah. like and what constraint ultimately is able to encompass other constraints within them Mm -hmm. That's the that's the that's the best way to kind of understand that question of constraint. You know, if you have a I mean, because you can see it like you you can have a family structure that's tyrannical, that is constraining you so much that it's actually sucking all the other possibilities out of you. So then you can say, well, that's excessive constraint because it doesn't leave room for you to play the guitar or for you to 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 be constrained by smaller things. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can see that happening at every single level of possible constraint that can happen. And yeah. that's why people are suspect of authority mm -hmm. because for it's real, it can happen and it happens all the time. And we, as humans, we're constantly running into the problem of excessive constraint at different levels of reality. You know, you could imagine someone who does it even within themselves, right? They become obsessive. They try to control everything. They control their diet like crazily. They control their schedule. They try to be super controlling of all of everything in them. Uh, and then at some point, usually that cracks, like you can't hold it because it, it, it actually doesn't work that way. Uh, and so we have to always be able to understand these, these constraints that are coming down upon us and see how... The, that's why the subsidiary model is the best one for, for, for my vision, because the subsidiary model is one in which the constraints above actually, and you could say, make the other ones possible rather mm -hmm. than prevent them. Right. So a good a good father, a good mother, they hold the family together so that the children will then become the best versions of themselves. 
And yeah. so that's not in competition. That's actually something that kind of, it's like a dance that, uh, of things that come together, right? It's a, yeah. it's more of an image of love. Uh, of yeah. how things come together with love. I've been thinking a lot about the idea of constraints, as you mentioned, right? From the embodied perspective of, uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to be a good man? What does it mean to be a good woman? And, you know, I, I, I was speaking with uh, a friend and he asked me, like, how is that different from just saying someone's a good person? Like, are those synonymous? Mm -hmm. And so I've been digging into that question a lot. It's like, yeah, I think it is different. And my first What's reaction was something like. It, you know, it's different. It's super interesting what you're saying, because it's different, but it's also the same in the sense that being a good person has to embody itself yeah. in all these other things. Just like being a good citizen has to embody itself differently at all the levels. That's the subsidiarity model. Yeah. And so it's different, but it's also aiming towards that higher ineffable thing because you can never be just a good person. That doesn't even mean anything. What the hell does that mean? It's like that good person has to be embodied in specific realities, which yeah. are anchored in an ineffable reality, which is something like be a good person, like love your neighbor, which is like, that doesn't mean anything unless you actually come face to face with your neighbor and do something to help them. Yeah. We, we That's what it to, means to be ineffable. We have by to way. enact it's it. Not we like a to... woo woo. Like yeah, people yeah. always like when you use things like ineffable or all these types of terms, people think it's just like, I'm, it's just like magical woo woo. It's, it's actually just how things work. Like things yeah. in order to, to, to become specific, they have to become specific and that, the thing that binds them ends up being ineffable to the specifics and it happens at every level, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to, there's something there that, that is really rich. So, um, John said something in one of your conversations. I'm John Verveke. Um, oh man, I, I, I missed it. Um, the, I want to get at this idea of, of how constraints afford in, in unique ways, mm -hmm. right? And how that allows us to be, oh, what you said is love is a mode of being, right? But it, it it's not, okay, this is, this is so important to me. I grew up in the counterculture, as I've mentioned lots of times in this conversation. Mm -hmm. What was the, what was, what was the claimed highest value of the counterculture? It was love, right? Love is all we need. But my experience of the counterculture is that, uh, is that love was really indulgence, mm -hmm. right? It collapsed to indulgence. And what it was, was a lot of narcissistic people saying, you have to allow me to indulge all the things that I do or else you're not being loving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that love actually needs, it needs constraint. It needs to say, here's what I'm willing to sacrifice, right? Love is something you sacrifice for. Um, and so you you oh and then this is the point that that John made right you you're trying to be loving right you're gonna you're gonna love people but you can't you can't actually show up in love the same way for your wife as you do for your child as you do for your best friend like this is something that my wife and I have been talking about in our dynamic is like there's ways in which I haven't been really great to her because I've expected her to play the game with me the way that I expect my best male friends to play the game. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so I, the, the mode of the way that the reason it's ineffable is because the mode of love, the way in which love has to express through me is contingent on the context of the relationship and Right. So I have to love my my oldest daughter differently than I love my son, differently than I love my my youngest daughter. And all of that is also like about who I am and what I bring to the table. Yeah. Right? So I've been thinking about ab about the constraints that our bodies create on us. Right. I my 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 daughters and my wife will come to me if there's a spider in the house and they need me to get rid of the spider. Right. Yeah. It's pretty silly. Like they could, they could learn to take yeah, out the spiders. We've right? If I wasn't that. here, we've they'd, take the spiders. they'd do it. Yeah. If you were in there, yeah. they would do it. It's not a problem really. Yeah. Right. But they, they prefer me to do it. Yeah. And it, and it has to do with like a very simple reality, which is that my body can take more damage than theirs can take. 
right? Mm -hmm. If I was to get bitten by a venomous spider, I'd be less likely to die just because I weigh 220 pounds, right? I have more blood to dilute the venom over, mm -hmm. right? And there's many ways in which my body gives me a unique set of constraints because it's large and it's strong and it's powerful and I have a deep voice and a beard. And so if there's a scary animal in our yard, of course, it's my role to go confront the scary animal mm -hmm. because at minimum, the, the scary animal is much more likely to run away if it's me confronting it. It yeah. doesn't mean that my wife can't do it when I'm not here, but we end up playing the, these roles for each other because of the way that we do that. And I've been, I've been thinking about, uh, about partner dance a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we have the, the male and the female and the lead and the follow. And that's something that like people aren't super comfortable with anymore. Um, and so, you know, everyone can be, learn to be a lead. Everyone can be learn to be follow. And I think that's actually useful. I think it's really useful as a lead to learn the follow, right? For empathy's sake. But, um, but there's actually a, a physical structural constraint on how dance plays out that makes it much more logical to have the larger, stronger physical human being Lead by the lead, yeah, right. It's it's just quite quite a, it's a quite a natural thing, and you have to fight it with a lot of effort in order to 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 get to get out of it. And it, like you said, it's weird that people take that want to uh, you could say uh, absolutize this situation, which is like okay, the man leads, the woman follows, but there there is a there's a reality to that dance which transcends the dance right it's like mm -hmm. if you're part of a team let's say you're part of a sports team and there's a team captain you're playing the role then the team captain is leading and you're following like you're playing the same role it's a different game but it's like there and you and if you've done that and you've done it successfully you realize that there's a kind of joy to being in a team with a great leader and following that great leader that it's yeah. not that it's not like the only position is the one in power and that that's the only one that is always there and that you're always like that's just not in reality we always kind of play these different parts of the game and there's actually joy in 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 being both a leader and a and a good follower so yeah if i if i was to play basketball when I, when i when i did play basketball right on a team i had a specific set of attributes that were really advantageous in in a specific role right i I'm, I, I'm quick, right? My feet are quick. I'm, I'm very fast off the ground, like mm. on rebounds. I'm strong and big and I can move people out of the way well, so I can box out really well. I have a sense for rebounds. Um, I'm fast and powerful and can jump high, but I don't have great fine motor coordination. I'm mm. not a particularly great ball handler. I'm not, I don't have very good peripheral vision. I'm not good at seeing people and being able to pass the ball to them. And I'm actually not a very good shooter. So like I'm I'm like you're a the rebound guy, right? I'm a Dennis Rodman archetype, That's right. not you're the a Dennis Michael Jordan Rod archetype, right? right? So I can so if if I'm on the right team and you can put me in that role, then I can excel and I can feel amazing in in providing that for people. Mm. But I ha but in order to do that, I have to accept like, hey, that's not the leader's role, right? The leader's role is the guy who has the combination of athleticism and fine motor coordination, who can be the gel that connects everyone else in the team. Yeah, but I have to be the follower in that situation because that's what my particular set of skills and talents affords me. Yeah, and that's a really wise understanding of how and why hierarchy exists. Because yeah. in the modern world, we tend to portray hierarchy only as top-down, um, you know, imposition of arbitrary authority. But in reality, that's and although it happens that 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 it happens that way. Often there's a kind of organic reality to hierarchy, which is like you said, it ends up being people playing their roles. And yeah. this has a lot of consequences for the way we actually view how things lay themselves out, lay themselves out. Like I have a, you know, a nephew who is super practical. Like, you know, he he, you know, if you had given him like a motor when he was 10 years old, he could have done anything with it. But he's just not he hates school. He's horrible at, at like the, the just abstract theory stuff, but we force him to go to school, to yeah. sit in that class and to, and to be, to be, feel like he's a complete loser for years of his life, because we have this idea that anybody can be anything and everybody, you could be a doctor if you put your mind to it. It's like, that's just a lie. Yeah. Like, and, and why it, can't he find the joy that he has in the things that he's actually good at? And just explore that and 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 be 
you know, and just fulfill them, fulfill himself more without having this weird idea that anybody can be anything. And it's, it's like, it's, and, and that way hierarchy, ten, not always, but sometimes it plays that role in affording, like you said, people in their, in their lane, the best possible life. Yeah. So the other thing about that, that move that we made as a society of getting rid of trade schools, of removing shop from, uh, from, uh, from high school, right. Was that we actually created a saying that anyone can be anything actually created a totalizing identification of what virtue looked like. What we were actually saying is if you're the kid who's going to be good at trades, don't and try to make yourself the that's kid right. who's good at abstract theory because that's the only thing our society values. Yeah, and it's and it's a it's a it's a lie, you know. It's it for for someone who has found great joy in like carving stone and carving wood, you mm -hmm. know the the type of joy that you find in in making things and accomplishing things, you know it's. It's not the same, you know, as an intellectual pleasure, an intellectual accomplishment, but really it's equivalent in terms of what it can, what type of sense of meaning and, and purpose that you find in that. So yeah, we're in a, we're in a, but that whole way of thinking, like you, you can see it, like that is really the consequence of this idea of the atomized individual, where mm -hmm. we don't understand the fractal and kind of the subsidiary vision of reality. Um, and it's what leads, honestly, to people who deny the constraints of their body, right? Mm -hmm. Who 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 think they can be anything, really anything, right? Yeah. They could be a cat man, yeah. or yeah. you know, like you know. And, and so this I this like kind of desire to be liberated from constraint ends up with the desire to be literally liberated from your body. It's a mm -hmm. it is a gnostic uh, vision in that sense. That's the that that I think is the transhumanist vision. Uh, I, I read Mary Harrington's book, um, Feminism Against Progress, this year, and she has this idea of meat Lego Gnosticism or bio libertarianism. Right? Mm. Bio libertarianism is the idea that, <clears throat> like, ultimately, in some sense, and this is even a critique that almost goes back to Orwell, machines, tech, technique, technology. It has this tendency because it offers us power, right? It has this tendency to um, colonize the way that we see things, mm -hmm. such that we value the types of power that it offers us and neglect everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so so we we can. You know, we can or we see on the horizon at least the ability to do all these things, right? Like, you know, um, <laughs> I always joke that, uh, you know, every man is going to become a trans masculine man, right? Because, yeah. Because none of us are masculine enough and we can go, we can go get steroids and make ourselves, right? Like, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, I heard someone say that Andrew Tate was a male to male trans person. And, uh, and <laughs> right. I was like, that's, that's, but that's it, right? Like, that's happening. That is a thing that is happening all over, which is people are hormonally manipulating themselves in order right. to conform to a uh, an ideal, right? Yeah. They they have adopted a kind of god that they're worshiping, and technology allows them to worship. At yeah, that well, especially information technology. I mean, this is this is was in some ways the the insight of the postmoderns, like it was the insight of Jean Baudrillard understanding that you know information technology reframes reframes archetypes and you could say um makes them more than real and so yeah. you have this problem because reality the way that we deal with reality is like say you lived in a village a thousand years ago right you would you would see men that are more muscular men that are a little shorter a little how overweight you would and you could identify the man that was maybe a little more a little taller a little more muscular a little more square jawed and you could identify that as a as a reality of virtue like something that's moving towards a purpose that you could identify as like something that has value and uh but now you've got like the most cut guy in in in, in like a billion people and then you can watch that person 
you know, for hours on end, mm -hmm. tell you that you could be like him if you only, well, you yeah. know, put in the time or whatever. It goes, it goes beyond that, right? We're not <laughs> even just looking at the most, you know, the most extreme exemplars. We're looking at extraordinary ma uh, manipulations to make them look like the most extreme exemplars. So yeah. Hugh Jackman, who, you know, maybe not naturally the most extraordinarily masculine man, but he's been pumped full of steroids in order to fulfill that. But yeah. even full of steroids, he had to water fast. Yeah, that's right. That I was like, going to say that. Like, there's also the the fact that these guys that you see are dehydrated when they get yeah. the picture. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, uh, yeah, I always think it's funny when, when you get this idea that, that men aren't being held to some kind of, uh, unrealistic beauty standard yeah yeah no that's uh that's obviously false yeah <laughs> yeah it's obviously false but you're right about the, your idea your image of technology is is right and and the problem is always a problem of place it's a problem of attention and a problem of why things aren't in the right order like this is what the question of worship that we kind of alluded to a few times before in our, our conversation is so important which is to have things in the right priority of attention. You know, the, one of the, another problem of the modern world is that we have fetishized science and technology to the idea that we think them as, we think that technology is an unquestionable good. Yeah. It is that any new power that we acquire is just inevitable. And it's a yeah. good that we should just, that is just going to happen. Like there's just nothing. This is just the progress of the human species. Uh, and we never ask ourselves the question of what it is that, that this new power is doing, what it can do, what it will do. We don't we don't even ask. We just like, well, here's AI. Well, here's this. We're, we'll put a chip in your brain. We'll you know, we'll we'll give you uh, we'll we'll give you some kind of you can imagine like making you stronger with some like nanotech thing in your uh -huh. bloodstream. Um and that is a consequence of not having things in their proper order. So there's nothing wrong with any of these technologies per se. It's mm -hmm. just that the fact that we we don't even put we don't even su subject them to anything. Exactly. We just put yeah. them out there. Exactly. What I wanted to say, I think you you, you pretty much said it was um that technology that is not subject to a good necessarily becomes the good in itself. Right? Yeah, it becomes a god in some ways. Yeah. It becomes a, the, like the a god technical of god that says. That, reor that reorganizes reality. Like the cell phone literally re reorganizes yeah. not only reality, it reorganizes our brains, it reorganizes our social network. It 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 is acting like like a god acts. Yeah, it's a will to power, right? The will to power through, you know, what you would call the garments of skin, the this capacity yeah. that we have to imagine new ways of interacting with the environment, which is which is beautiful and powerful and can be put in its proper place, but it has to be subsumed to a, a higher good. Um, you know, that's, I, I've thought about, I don't, have you ever looked at my dad's art? Uh, I, not sure, I don't think so, maybe. If I have, I forgot. I feel like I've mentioned him to you. I think you'd find it interesting um, as an artist. But my, my, my dad, Sunray Kelly, uh, was a world famous natural builder who built with cob and straw bale and found wood, right? Like all sorts of crazy structures. Um, and uh, wow, no, I've never looked at your dad's art. That's amazing. Like <laughs> right out of Lord of the Rings, there. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so you anticipate where I'm going already. Uh, so. My dad's houses are beautiful, but they were drafty and leaky and dysfunctional. And my dad was so consumed with his art that he didn't really show up particularly well as a dad. So I had all sorts of resentments towards my dad. Yeah. So <clears throat> I get into my, my, I guess I was 30 and I invited people to come to that, the property that my dad had. Uh, my dad offered me to like camp my, my students out there for a weekend. And, and I did, and I felt really kind of like, um, awkward about taking people out there because it's it's not as manicured as i would like like it, it had higher it had all this potential that wasn't fully realized and my dad's got these junked out trucks just sitting on the lot and um and we get there and everyone is just like gobsmacked like this is the most magical amazing thing that they've ever experienced and mm -hmm. so for 10 years i've been taking people there and teaching people there and and then people discover my work and then they're like wait you're sunray's son like 
oh my God, I follow him. It's like, okay, well, a lot of people seem to independently find both of what we do interesting. Hmm. And um, and so I, I've been like I've been able to see my dad's art through the eyes of my students for years. And it took me years to really see it and recognize how powerful it was and how much it was actually contributing to the power of my events just by being in the space that he had created. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment where I was thinking about, you know, all these things, spell the sensuous and what the Robin knows and my conversations with you and conversations with John Verveke. I was thinking about uh, Tolkien and Tolkien's, I actually, no, I remember specifically, it was, um, it was your conversation with, I think, Paul Kingsnorth on Rebel Wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you guys talked about um, Tolkien's idea of oh, recovery, mm -hmm. right? That, the, that, we, that we need a relationship to reality of recovering, right? And I don't know if this was your language or my language, but I came up with this idea of the, the eschatology of escape. The transhumanism mm -hmm. offers us an eschatology of escape. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately kind of the problem of technology, which is that whatever your problems are, we can just get more power. So every way that you suffer, every way that you do, and and then ultimately that somehow results in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And, and what Tolkien, I think, pointed to was... It's not that technology is bad, but when technology becomes a totalizing force, when it becomes the run one ring, mm. it becomes more. Yeah. And and he portrayed the idea that we we have to, you know, Tolkien, the arch conservative, says, I speak for the trees. Mm -hmm. I speak for the trees. And so I like I basically when I was in second grade, I knocked a kid over and grabbed the back of his head and smacked his face off the concrete until his nose and mouth split open. Like I was in a very, I was very, very traumatized by my dad's neglect, by the chaos of the counterculture, by, um, by, um, by my learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that helped me going into martial arts, helped me various things. But one of the things that really, really helped me was uh, having the Lord of the Rings read to me when I was eight and I've been in love with that story ever since. Mm -hmm. And so there was this moment where I realized that I think what I'm doing with Evolve Move Play is creating a set of practices that bring people into recovery, that bring in their relationship to the natural world, that, that act out the eschatology of return to connection to the life world. Mm -hmm. And that my dad's art was was architecture trying to return itself to connection with the life world in the way that Tolkien was, was pointing to in literature. Hmm. So for me, there's this, this, this connection. And I, and I think that, um, that this, that this, that we need to accept technology and we need to, recognize how dangerous it is when it becomes our god and people have been people have been talking about ai alignment right and it's like yeah we have that problem it's not in the future right <laughs> social media is an ai alignment problem it's an yeah. algorithm with a lot of intelligence that we don't understand that's driving us literally insane you know and we you've, i'm sure you've seen the the mental health crisis stuff with young people that Gene mm -hmm. Twinge and, and Jonathan Hyde are talking yeah. about. It's like, it's, it's, it's here. We're experiencing, we're living in it. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. It's a, and it, if you want to see how, I think how agency, let's say su agency that is beyond the, an individual works, this is a great time to perceive it because you know in in the past those types of agencies moved quite slowly you could say yeah. so you could you could pretend like they don't exist because you don't kind of see them run through uh the world they're acting at a slower pace but now with social media we're seeing agencies you know constrain behavior towards extremely dire uh consequence and with extremely dire consequences and it's happening very fast so like my, you know, our, my children, 
I saw it happen like with my kids, like because we homeschool my kids and they didn't have very much access to media or technology a little bit. Like, you know, we'd watch a movie once a week or whatever. It was quite, quite constrained. But then, you know, after our house was flooded and we we were living in chaos for like a year, we had to put them in school. Like there was just no, no, yeah. no option. So we we put them in school and in school, they literally had to have a phone. Yeah. Like the teachers said, were giving their homework mm -hmm. on the phone. Like they would, they, if they didn't have a phone, you couldn't participate. You couldn't upload your, 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 your um, homework. You couldn't, there was all this stuff that, and they would have quizzes during class on their phones. So we ended up having to like give our 13 year old a phone. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, then it was like fighting a demon. Like you're literally fighting a demon every day. And you're like, you're just trying to like fight this thing that's trying to take over your child's life. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, and there's nobody controlling it. It's not like a, it's not like a person. It's not like some shady guy with like strings on his end of his fingers. It's just, it's, but it is a coherent agency that is bringing coherent, uh, you know, transformation in people and moving them towards visible coherent goals. Mm -hmm. And you can see where it's going and nobody can stop it. Okay. So where it's going and how we get out of it. Uh, so this, you've, you've talked a lot about this and, and, and it's something that it's really aligned for me, which is this, this sense of how we are oriented towards a greater and greater individualism that necessarily collapses into a more intense tyranny. Yeah. And, you know, you, we, we, we mentioned James Lindsay and, and Lindsay has been an extraordinary um, researcher on some of the the, the 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 stuff behind it, but he does. I don't see him with a theory of what replaces the tendencies that are going wrong, and I don't see him doing a balance of of looking at how these same tendencies are actually occurring across the political spectrum. Like one thing I noticed, like talking about the idea of subsidiarity, I remember having this insight. Years ago, I used to read um, a blogger named Steve Saylor, who's a you know kind of famously racist guy, but uh, you know he's actually a very brilliant social scientist. You know, he uh, he, and you know one of his his big political philosophy is based on the idea of citizenship. Right, the nation state should orient its policies based on the good of the citizens of the current state. Mm -hmm. Seems really simple, right? Whoever's in the state, let's do that. So that sounds kind of like, like subsidiarity, right? And so you have all these people around him who are very concerned about immigration, which is understandable. And then at the same time, they're super supportive of going to Walmart. Mm -hmm. right? And then I live in Bellingham, Washington, and I go to places where people are like hyper, hyper concerned about localism when it comes to food. Yeah. And they're open borders. That's right. And I was like, I don't think either of these make sense together. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Like a, and it's not that, it's not that, that, that either that either coherent extreme is the answer, right? Like there are real values to economies of scale, and there are real values to diversity of thought and cross pollination. And there's also real costs to um, one of the things I notice about, you know, traveling the world teaching is that you see almost more groupthink in some ways in the places that are most newly diverse. There's a way in which um, as we try to bring together a multiplicity, we end up needing to adopt an extremely shallow and tight and novel uh, unifying aspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well, that's the tendency that I'm trying to point out is that yeah. as you know as you move towards if you move as you move towards multiplicity or as you move towards fragmentation, you will you always need something to join you together. And if that thing isn't subsidiary, that is if that thing doesn't connect you, at yeah. little levels and that builds up, then it's going to become more and more encompassing. There's no yeah. way around it. And, and more yeah. and more. One of the, one of the 
thinkers who's really popular um, with kind of the the general sort of group of people that I would hang out with in in Bellingham and around is uh, you've all know Harari, right? And he's someone who has really stated, you know, very openly that you know he thinks there needs to be a one world government, right? Yeah. And and his 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 thesis for that is that we face problems that weren't faced in the uh, past that require a level of unity that we haven't had in the past, right? So existential risk, um, like we, you know, like in the AI space, everyone's talking about multipolar traps, right? We can't get out of creating the AI that will destroy us because if we don't do it, then China will do it and they'll get the power, yeah, right? And so the the answer to this that's coming from the WEF types is, well, then we're just going to take over everything. Yeah, because obviously they have all the best intentions for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's of course but, this is this is the problem, right? The the and I actually I remember seeing Elon Musk, I think he was on some Saudi like uh, mm-hmm. uh interview, and I thought, wow, he understands some of this really well. They said, you know, when are we gonna have a world government? And he said, We can't have a world government because if we have a world government and it fails, it means we all are over. Mm-hmm. We actually need multiplicity so that if something fails, there's resilience in the system so that something else can come and and replace it. It's like there's that's actually that's a very kind of I mean, he wasn't specifically think of subsidiarity, but that is one of the things that subsidiarity offers is a type of resilience. If you yeah. create a one world government with a one world identity and a one world uh, uh, currency and a one, I mean, you are just running towards a wall at some point, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in 10 years, but at some point you're going to hit it and then everything's going to come tumbling down. I mean, it's a tower of Babel really. Yeah. 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 I think that's such a good analogy. The way that I've been thinking about it is, well, I think that we do, you know, we do face problems of higher order coordination, right? Like hunter forger societies don't have the same coordination problems across thousands of miles that we do. And so in some sense, there are problems that are now arising at a level where we need a more civilizational response. Um, And yet there's this tendency of hierarchies to to colonize down in a way that actually makes systems far less adaptable. And this is one of the key insights that like Nassim Taleb shared in his books is like, if you look at the Rhineland states, you know, they were incredibly um, economically um, vibrant in part because each was a unique experiment in how a city functions. And this allowed them to, to, explore the adaptive space of how to organize a city much better than something that had more top-down control. Yeah. I've, in, I've been thinking about this, even at the level of like the family, right? So my wife and I maybe disagree about certain uh, beliefs. And one response that you could have is like, well, I know the facts, I'm right, she needs to adopt my position. But the other is to say, well, actually, we're part of a, we're part of a group spirit where her perspective and her different temperament means that she won't ever see things exactly like I do, but it's the synoptic vision that comes between the two of us that best serves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we have to have that ability to, I, I, my, my philosophy is kind of, we want to control things at the local level. We, everything that can be done at the local level needs to be done at the local level. And I think that's what you're describing the subsidiarity. And we can see that we need to solve some problems at a higher level, but then that thing that we set up to solve the problems at the higher level starts saying, Hey, maybe I'll take that. Maybe I'll take that. Maybe I'll take that. And it becomes incredibly tyrannical. Well, that's what, and the the difficulty when I talk about this stuff, which how can I say this? It might make it difficult for people to, to understand is that I'm not even thinking about morality. I'm here. You're there. Okay. I'm not even looking at this through a lens of, of morality in the end completely. It's just something which is happening. And technology, the increase in power 
is, is making it happen, right? So the increase in technological power is that which is creating the, the problems that Harari is seeing mm -hmm. that are now at higher and higher scales. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that, that it's not running towards that, towards the, it's not running towards the 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 kind of game theory move into centralization that will lead to fragility and breakdown, right? So, I mean, the image of the story of Babel is not a is not arbitrary. In the story of Babel, it says that they started to make bricks out of they started to make bricks and mortar, and making bricks and mortar was part of the part of what led to their problem. Because all of a sudden they had the capacity to to make themselves more powerful, to mm -hmm. separate themselves more fully from the outside, to create these these structures, to create a tower that loomed over all the other buildings, and all of that had an effect. Now it's not an effect that's you could even say that it's like it's not a morally simple thing. It's not saying it's bad or good ultimately, because it's just it's just going to happen. Right. And as we move towards these more powerful technological systems, as we move towards more capacity to su for surveillance, more capacity for identification, more capacity, you know, with AI, this is going to just move towards that point. Uh, I don't really see a way around it. It's not a, it's not a, and like I said, it's not a, I don't want to sound like I'm being apocalyptic. I'm just seeing that the process is apocalyptic. Is, this the process has started, and I don't see anybody with the capacity to stop it. I think with our there are ways to uh, to collect seeds, you could say, mm -hmm. right? To to let's say to create resilience within the system that will survive the system. I think that that's possible. There are ways to 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 go against the centralizing tendency in a manner that will lead to the best life possible within the circumstance uh, by creating community, by connecting to the people around you, by making sure your family's strong, making sure you are also a healthy, you know, well-centered person, like all of that are things that we can do. But in terms of the global situation, in terms of the global story, this is happening folks. Like, I mean, the AI thing has, has put it into hyperdrive. I don't see, any yeah. way around it there's a weird way in which i feel like that could loop back right i have this this sense that um like it's very easy to see a potential for the information ecology that exists online to be completely unreliable within a decade right we we will have deep fakes where we can just have anybody do anything and um you know my, my brother was telling me about a a story that that came out about um someone had like gotten recordings of someone's mother and they had the ai generate that the mother's voice and then had the mother call and say that she'd been in a car accident yeah, yeah, yeah. and that she needed money, money to be wired right. right yeah this is this is their future but you no. know what the solution to that is, Rave. Come on, you know what that is. It's that we need a stamp. We need, oh, yeah. we, need <laughs> we need we need a the government to tell us what's real. Blockchain, yeah. And we need that to happen at global levels. So it's like when Harari says that we, that we need a world government, mm -hmm. it's like the, the reality is that that is going to happen by the very processes that you talk about, which is that. As technology destabilizes, you always need something to restabilize or else you collapse. Mm -hmm. And so that, that constraint will have to become more and more powerful as the power to destabilize becomes more powerful, right? The, the terrorism led to, you know, the 9-11 the attack led to more control, more surveillance, more power on people that, that, the, that in than anything anybody could have imagined before, right? Going into the U.S. after 9-11, since then, has become like a crazy, you know, authoritarian yeah. situation. I know. Like, I, I I live 45 minutes from the border, um, and there's a, you know, Vancouver, B.C. is like 
one of the coolest cities out there. There's an incredible parkour community. I never go, right? It's much closer. It's actually closer for me than Seattle if I could zip through the border. But um, border wait times are totally... Um, yeah, they're crazy. They're they're Well, they're highly variable, right? Yeah. So it could be quick or it could not be quick. And you don't know, which is super disincentivizing. If you're like, it'll be 45 minutes or three hours. It's really hard to like... Yeah make any plans based off of and um <laughs> the uh also like i get detained all the time when i go across i don't know why yeah sure you so, do they don't, I, they... i've had so many problems at the border in my life like just constant problem so <clears throat> and you and you drive up to the border and there it tells you it's like smile sir we're taking your biometrics mm -hmm. and uh you're in the system now yeah. And so it's like, of course, and the maybe who knows how much they track you yeah. once they have your, your biometrics, you don't even know, like, is your, is your, can they use this to know where you are all the time? Can they use this to access what you're doing? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of, uh, I, I, I leverage technology for strength and conditioning stuff. Right. So I know, um, I know how well I slept last night based on my phone. I know how, uh, how many minutes of intense exercise I've done so that I yeah, can, yeah. you know, I can get a feedback system. So this week I'm going to do 330 minutes. And then next week I go to do 350 minutes. And that way I can, I can not overtrain myself in a much more intelligent way, mm -hmm. but there's really nothing that stops, uh, you know, like in theory, it's all private, but we know, we know that intelligence agencies have hacked that. We know that they've, that they've got, that they've got agents on the boards of all of, the major tech platforms. No, but not only do we know, they tell us because when they catch a criminal now, they yeah. literally tell us that they caught him because of his phone. Yeah. Like they, 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 they don't tell us how they don't say, well, we don't, we're not going to, you know, but they say like, Oh, they basically all of a sudden have all their emails. They all of a sudden have like their entire history, uh, search history, their entire, it's like, well, well, how did you get that? You know, it's, this yeah. is supposed to be private until, until it's not, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so Daniel Schmachtenberger has talked about the idea that we're, we're running towards these limits. And I, I'm a bit more skeptical of some of that thinking and, and the danger of it actually, right? Like this was a big theme at ARC, which is when we assume that resources are finite, we end up behaving in ways that are deeply tyrannical. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm reading a book called uh, the, the Wizard and the Prophet. And it talks about every time that we've freaked out about peak oil and how it's always been wrong and it's yeah. always resulted in tyranny. But we are, we are running technology towards a point where it really creates existential risk, at least at the level of the existence of our social structures and well-being. Yeah. You know, maybe we can't nuclear bomb ourselves into an actual extinction but uh we can ai ourselves to you know to, to we can AI ourselves to isolation at least i mean we saw happen during covid yeah. you know technology afforded for us the capacity to isolate people from each other for months <laughs> i saw i saw a um <laughs> a like you know pro technology um twitter account and they said, like, here's a bunch of things that technology has done for us. And here's what, you know, what is it going to do next? And one of the things it said was that, um, was that the smartphone has solved boredom. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Woo! That's amazing. That's an amazing statement to make as if you're, you're that's a, that's a very strange brag. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. what wow, are, are people? Yeah, apparently people are truly blind to how uh, these solutions have costs, right? Deeply problematic costs. It's like, I mean, cocaine can solve boredom too. That's right. That's right. <laughs> cocaine can solve boredom. Oh right. my goodness. And then what it's like, it? then you're like, oh, it's weird. Why are people not like getting into long-term relationships? Why are people checking out of sex? Why are people not having kids? And it's like, hey, we solved boredom, folks. We're going <laughs> to keep you busy, you know, tapping on this little thing or, you know, for, for the rest of your life. <laughs> we have, so 
So in that conversation, that uh, I'm referencing a conversation Daniel yeah. Schmackenberger had with John Vervaeke and Ian McGilchrist, and it was quite interesting because when pushed, both McGilchrist and um, and Vervaeke said that basically the only solution to these existential risks, the only solution to these these sort of finite games that are running, right? Like you said, it's inevitable that it's inevitable. Well, how do we solve the you know, what Schmachtenberg calls the meta crisis. Both said religion. It was really interesting to me to watch McGilchrist in particular, because McGilchrist, I've seen basically uh, in the past say, yes, we need God, but we don't like, you know, maybe not, not Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's basically, I think that I don't, I shouldn't be too confident in my statement, but I've seen him, it feels like, dismiss Christianity as an answer. And in that conversation, he said he said repeated, uh, several times, I see the value that Christianity offered more clearly now. Hmm. Yeah. And then John, John, you know, John's belief is that we need a kind of a, a this religion that is not a religion, right? The, the, the kind of evolutionary jump in religion that we saw in the axial age needs to happen again to solve the new the new problem that we face but both of them are pointing to something like religion and i have the same sense like to go back a step right you're talking about um we're talking about the problem of of the problem of coordination at higher levels yeah and what what plays that role like christianity actually did play that role for the states of europe the states of europe were not perfectly united they killed each other all the time they weren't nearly as cooperative as they could be but there's some way but if you look at history the level of cooperation in trade the level of cooperation on many different levels between the different christian societies was stronger than them to non-Christian societies. And the same was true of Islam. Islam yeah. created uh, an extraordinary unification that allowed a multiplicity of states to play a game well together. Yeah, or at least better than without it. Yes, yeah. Better than they had, better along some important dimensions, at least. Yeah. Right. So there's a... Like, I guess my, where I end up right now, which is very interesting for me, is that I kind of believe in, I end up in, in this place where I'm like, something that, something like a religion. Because if you look at the, all those, this misalignment problems, and you look at the power of technology, and you look at all of that, and you ask, what kind of force could help human beings organize their their behavior to respond to this. It's like the only thing that I can see is the church or a church, yeah, right? Definitely. Not any specific church. Um, and, you know, if you think about this, the foundation of the, the, the liberal dem democratic experiment, it was based on the idea, you know, Adam Smith believed that you had to have a moral core for yeah. capitalism to run well. And so we had, we had government to, you know, organize certain things. We had, the market to organize certain things and we had we had religion to organize people to to have the virtue so that they didn't corrupt the institutions of capitalism and government yeah yeah, yeah. and we've lost that right? and we're replacing it right in some sense the government is the new religion or the yeah, market or is even the the conservative the kind of the kind of communistic vision or the you know the different images it has, whatever DEI or however you want to phrase it, is is very religious in its structure. Yeah. You know, it has all the trappings, and it it uh, it's running very similar in a similar way that a than a religion runs. And I think it that's what happened during um, <clears throat> revolutionary times as well. Is that in in Russia the the communistic system ran in with patterns that were similar to religion um but the problem is that it's inevitable like you said if you 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 it's going to happen whether you are deliberate about it or not uh the question is how should it happen and how can it happen so that it's 
so that it it is the best version of those types of patterns. Because really, religion is just the word religion itself means that which connects. Mm -hmm. it, that's what it. That's what religion is. It's the. It's a connector. It connects people together into higher participations, and so that's why there are aspects even of state that look like religion in the mm -hmm. sense that you know we have. You know, why do judges wear robes, for goodness sake? Why do you think policemen wear uniforms? Like all of these are, are liturgical actions, symbolic representations in order for you to be able to recognize unity within the multiplicity. And so even within the state, there are structures and ways it plays out that that are religious in the, in the broadest sense, right? In the sense that they are kind of ritualized um, and ordered ways of being that that make unity possible but that has to always move up towards higher participations and yeah. for that to, you know and it, and different cultures have managed that in different ways uh but and but we don't totally control it that's the that's the that's one of the problems of dealing with with higher agencies is that for the same reason that you can't stop the AI race, right? For the same reason that you, we can't just say, for the same reason that you can't just decide that gold isn't worth anything, you also can't just make up a new religion. Yeah. Right? It, it, it is a Kairos transformation. It's something that we, we recognize that we can participate in, but that we can't just say, well, I don't like, you know, I don't like, so I'm just going to make a new one or, or it, it just doesn't, I mean, people do that, but it, it, it runs into insane, like it runs uh, amok very fast and creates all the insane new age cult kind of stuff that we saw from the sixties until now. We were talking about religion and yeah. how it's a Kairos, like it's a Kairos question, right? And so Kairos. it's say, Advent. Say more about Kairos, sorry. So <laughs> I want to make sure the audience It's, it's the sense that, so how can I say this, right? At, at, a, at a little level, okay, let, let, let's take a very, very easy, simple vision of Kairos that's not, that's not, uh, that, that'll sound ridiculous at the outset, you'll get it once it plays through, which is that um, when it's time to wash the dishes, you know it's time to wash the dishes because all the dishes are dirty and they're on the counter and you have soap and you have water and then you wash the dishes. Yeah. Right? If you're outside, skiing and you say let's wash the dishes <laughs> that's a ridiculous thing you can't wash the dishes because the things haven't come together into the right moment with the right elements revealing to you that now's the time to wash the dishes okay that's yeah. what kairos is and so that happens at different uh scales right where we recognize that things are at the in their right position and are kind of transforming and are changing. So these things kind of follow cycles, right? There are cycles of Kairos, which is there's time to reap, there's a time to sow, there's a time to do all these, all these things. And those times are right, and you do them when it's time. Now, one of the things that technology has done is make us stretch that Kairos, make us not see it as easily. Make us think that anything is possible anytime, right? Yeah. I can eat at any time, you know, because I have electric lights, I can work at any time and everything. But the, the Kairos reality of how world, the world works is still there. And that is true about religion, which is why people say religion is revealed. Religion isn't something that people make up. Mm. It's mm. actually something that happens. And you can't decide when it happens. You can't control it. You can't totally manipulate it and so so the desire to just say well you know like this christianity it's it's finished like it's played its part you know now let's start a new thing well no humans. yeah you're, you if you do that you're, you're, you're you'll make a monster and it's not and it's not going to it's going to work that's why yeah. the that's the eschatological vision like the idea like in, in that christ is going to return yeah it means you're not you don't control when that change is going to happen Right, the idea that the you know the last uh, avatar of Vishnu will transform the world—it's like you don't decide when that happens. Yeah, it and will I mean, culminate and 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 the and the change will be revealed to you. 
John is not saying we do that. He's saying, this is what I see, right? What he sees is that there's a change such that it doesn't seem like, and, and, you know, that, that, that is the thing to wrestle with, which is if, if Christianity is the answer to, to what's happening right now, why did we get to what's happening right now? Cause we already had it. The reality is that it's the end, <laughs> the end of something and the beginning of something are, don't look the same, yeah. you know, realizing that you're at the end of something doesn't mean that, how can I say this? Doesn't mean that there isn't a way to play out the end as the best as possible. Right. So it's like, you could say, uh, like, let's take a radical example, which is that a human life, you know, you come to the end of the human life and you say, well, I wish, yeah. you know, as my strength is leaving me, I wish as my, you know, as I lose my, my capacities that I could be 20 again and mm -hmm. I could, I could do this. And it's like, well, that's just not where you are. That's just not. And so you can't make it up. Like you yeah. can't say because I'm losing my strength and I'm in this moment. Therefore, I should be 20 and 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 rambunctious. It's like, and I think that that's, a, you could say that, I know that that sounds weird to people to say, it's like, it is in some ways the end of Christianity. I believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that there is no other game. Mm -hmm. At least all the games that I've seen are, are bullshit. Like they're yeah. in the technical sense. They're people pretending and they're and they're like there there's this weird kind of makeup made made up thing, you know, where people think that they're Buddhists or people think that they're that they're that they I don't know, like they're this new age version of whatever thing they're doing, but it 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 usually runs amok like really fast and it and it just kind of shatters. Do you feel like most do you, how many people do you think are thinking that they're Christian? I would say very few people think that they're Christian, but that's also part of, in some ways, the forgetting at the end, right? It's something like it's something kind of dissipating itself. Because I oh. feel like there's a way in which, um, like, I, I created this little hierarchy of Christianity for myself, right? Which is that uh, you can grow up within a Christian cultural frame, right? And and that, and you're a Christian in that sense, right? And then you can you can sort of educate yourself about Christianity. And like know what it is you're playing in. Maybe that's a second level. And then there's a level at which you could take on the Christian ethos, the Christian ethics, the Christian story um, in yourself. And that that's an, another more, let's say, more embodied level of Christianity. But then there's then there's like you have to go do Christian stuff, right? You got to go do the liturgy. You got to go participate. You got to go be with other Christians. You mm -hmm. know or two or three are gathered in my name, right? Like you got to actually do that if you want to be a Christian. Yeah. Right. And then there is a, you know, maybe, and I'm not even sure if this is necessary, but maybe there's something like you have to make like Christian theological claims ontologically prior for you. Mm -hmm. And so like for myself, I'm at three and I'm definitely not at four or five, right? <laughs> <laughs> Like I definitely consider myself a follower of Christ. When you asked at at um, at Ark, like you know, raise your hand if you're religious. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Depends what yeah, you yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but so, but I, but I feel like within our society, there's a lot of people who are um, who are in some sense LARPing their Christianity in the same way that it feels like my experience of a lot of Buddhists is that they're kind of LARPing, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're not embodied in tradition in such a way that they can even access what Buddhism meant in its traditional societies. Yeah. And that's what I was referencing. Yeah, no, for sure that exists. That that's a, that's a hundred percent, but the, I would say that the value especially for a person, because I think at a smaller scale, there is the capacity to remember, right? And so you could imagine like what's happened from the time of the enlightenment until now is a kind of slow forgetting where at the at the beginning, we kind of forget the, the thing that's holding it all together. And mm -hmm. we write out 
the the fruits of what was there before. So we we keep moving, even though we forgot where we what was holding us together. We keep moving, and it seems like it's going okay for now. Right? But we don't realize that have, having cut that thread, you know, things are going to run out. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a way, and this is an image that happens in a lot of traditional stories that it's there is the possibility of of remembering, right? And remembering the the core. So you could say that if like, let's say you take your situation where you have this idea that, you know, I have basic Christian values. I kind of see the Christian values are, are, are good. They're a good way to run the world. And, and when I encounter, let's say people or situations where people aren't acting with those Christian values, I can see the difference. I'm offended. I'm, 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 I'm kind of freaked out because I can see that there are actually different ways to, to live uh, things out. Like if you ended up in a, like a, like in a, in a, in a Somali war zone, you know, with yeah. like warlords, you know, taking women is bound is booty. It's like, you know, you would maybe like, huh, I kind of miss that, miss yeah. those Christian values, you know, Andrew Tate. I'm not a fan of Andrew Tate. That's right. Well, there, there's an example. So, but then there's a way in which you can learn, start to remember that those values aren't independent from the story that gave birth to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And those values aren't independent from the attention that at least someone has to give to that origin. Right. It's like if if we if everybody stops giving attention to the thing that gave birth to this, then it's going to run out. And so it's like it's a it's a it's a work to be done. But there's a way in which that can slowly grow where you're like, OK, you know, I realize that if we don't attend to this, then it runs out. Well, what does it mean to attend? You know, yeah. what does it mean to attend to the to the to the source of all of this? Well, it ends up looking like celebrating Christmas. And, you know, maybe on Christmas you you do open the gifts, but maybe you just read that one chapter in the God, you know, in the yeah. gospel of, of, of Luke or whatever, right? Bought, and you just sorry. I bought uh the action Bible for my <laughs> for my kids this Christmas and God's dog. I bought God's there dog. There you go. And 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 I have we have watched videos of it and you know, it was interesting. Like we just watched one little, not very good animated version of the Gospels when my kids were like uh, five and seven, my mm -hmm. oldest two, and they were like they were Christians, right? <laughs> they were just like, but now they're not. My my like my daughter, my oldest daughter is like she's definitely not a Christian. Yeah, uh, it's like it's an interesting thing to to see play out. But but there's a power to that story, you know. And and I like I actually kind of I saw a Twitter thread about how secular Christmas is is over right it's like it's run its course it doesn't have the power that it had and people are 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 acting it out but they're not feeling the spirit of it and i felt that this year and i was like i don't i don't i don't want this to be the center of it anymore right like it's very you know in part partly again it's like constraints it's my kids get excited for christmas but i don't think they get excited like i got excited for christmas because they're so much wealthier than I was, right? Like they have six grandparents basically who pour gifts into the house at a rate that we can't keep up with. And we have to like, you know, we, just, we, we are trying to sift through the stuff that's coming in so that we can not be overwhelmed by it. Whereas mm. when I, you know, like I grew up, you know, under the poverty line. So Christmas yeah. was like, that's my toy for the year. That's gonna... Yeah, the one gift. Yeah, that was me too. You know, like, yeah, so gift. like that, like when mom got Christmas right, like it, it meant a lot. You know, I mm. remember gifts that I got for years, right? I would play with the same thing for years. And so it had a different kind of power in that case. And then, you know, I get together with my family on Christmas and we have Christmas dinner, but it's just an excuse to have a dinner, right? There's nothing there's nothing more to it. It's, it, it's not. And I was, and it's funny, like I've been, I've been experiencing ritual and the power of ritual for the last 10 years. And then slowly accepting that ritual is part of what makes it powerful. But um, for instance, there's a, there's a waterfall. Uh, we, we hike down this Creek and we end up at this waterfall mm -hmm. and in the waterfall, there's a tunnel. Uh, that goes straight up through the rock and so wow, swim underneath the waterfall and climb through the tunnel. And it's obviously like 
the most symbolic thing that you could do mm. right or maybe not the most symbolic but it's pretty it's damn pretty, symbolic right you're pretty, literally reborn through a moist right, tunnel. waterfall a tunnel like it's right. pretty pretty close yeah you know you come out with you know completely soaking and you know like racked by the experience so so we we did that for years and it had a lot of power for people but then we actually were like, what if we intentionally made this ritual? What if we actually thought about it? And so we we started to organize all the people into tribes so they could support each other. And then we started to, we, we had a song. And so we mm -hmm. sing a song and we're chanting and singing and clapping as each mm -hmm. person comes through the thing. And we have people there to welcome them, right? And uh And we can do more, right? Like one of the things that I've been doing is like, what do you, who do you want to be on the other side of that, right? What do you want to let go of as you're going through this, right? We haven't done that actually, but that's probably the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done that a couple of times. <laughs> I don't know if I told you this. It's a funny story. So uh, when I got the call that I was going to be on Jordan Peterson last year, right? Um, I was in the middle of a very intense political thing that was happening that I really didn't want to be the primary thing that I talked to him about, but that it could have easily been the primary thing that we talked about in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I had been like researching all day, trying to re respond to this thing that was happening in my community. So I walked down to the, the, there's a 15 minutes from my house. There's another waterfall, it's same, same area, but there's a 30 foot cliff there. So I walked down to that and I, and I sat on the edge of the cliff and I did a Qigong right, breathing exercise. And I just kind of did this mantra in my head, like when I hit that water, I'm going to wash away what I'm currently concerned about. And I'm going to come out ready to focus completely on the things that are most important in the conversation with Jordan. So I did that for like 10 minutes and I jumped off. This was in February. I hit the water, I climbed out and I had the absolute clarity for the rest of the three days that I got to prep for my interview mm -hmm. and was completely there. So I, I can see the power of those things. And I don't experience that power from secular Christmas, but I also don't experience it when I have tried to go to the Christian church. Um, and this is something, you know, I talked to Paul Anleitner recently. And he was sort of saying like, he sees something in, in me, something in John that is aspirational right, mm -hmm. from a Christian perspective. Um, and I have the sense that there's some kind of, there's some way in which it feels like the, Christianity has withered away part of the body that needs to be yeah. reborn. Yeah. I mean, of course there, of course there's a sense in which uh, there's been a dilution of, of the, the most powerful aspects of Christianity. You know, a simple example is for the Jesus prayer, mm -hmm. you know, you, the Jesus prayer in the Eastern church used to be, I mean, I think it still is to some extent like it, really was the central practice, you know, this re 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 repeated prayer with breathing and, um, and attention to the heart and this kind of, and, uh, uh, and then in the 19th century with all the modernizing, you know, the, the, they got rid of the physical part of the, mm -hmm. the practice because they saw it as weird and suspicious and maybe unhealthy and maybe dangerous or whatever. Um, it is actually dangerous, like any kind of, any type of practice if you're not properly guided. Um, so you can see that it was like this sad situation where a, a, a practice that has been central to the church for a thousand years started to uh, to fade away. I don't think it's completely gone, but you know the, it's it's been diminished. And that's a that's a that's a reality, you know. But uh, the thing about the church, which is great, is that we're the church. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not it's not when you understand that you realize that it's then it's not it's no longer this idea of like, oh, well, the government should do that. Right. It's like, well, no, it's us, you know. And so, yes, there is a an hierarchy. There is an authority. But we all and it's a dynamic system and we can all have an effect on how it plays out ultimately by participating. But, uh, you, you know, <laughs> The ritual part, you're right. And it, it, once you understand that, you realize that there's so much of it that is, you know, that we do all the time, this kind of ritualization of reality in order to make it meaningful. It's n There's nothing weird or wrong or 
or you know suspicious that is uh superstitious about it it's actually just how things work um but there's obviously like there's obviously a hierarchy you know there are things that are more meaningful and more worthy of you know ritualizing you could say although it happens on its own you don't you yeah ritualize i mean that. if i had for me personally at least right the the reorganization power in my spirit of jumping off a 30 foot cliff and hitting ice cold water you know that that was powerful that, that would bring it to church it's like if church could be <laughs> jumping off a 30 foot cliff into ice cold water i'm there man i'm yeah. there well i think it is church actually right like that's something that uh that john has said to me is like you're you're running a church you know and i'm that was uncomfortable for me but eventually i came to see that if you think about church in a specific way you think about it in a, in a large sense of how uh how practice is embodied in community mm -hmm. then in that sense that's true right but these are you know sort of yeah well the 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 greek word for church which is ecclesia it mm -hmm. means gathering it just means gathering yeah. so we need to gather we need to gather it's a, it's a gathering, yeah. oriented towards a higher good and we need to engage practices that allow it to catalyze in and and to allow that spirit you know like at, at arc i was I, was, I really enjoyed Joshua Luke Smith's poetry and I really enjoyed okay. the music. And I thought, this is really good, but if they could get everyone to sing something, it would it would it would embody arc into the people more powerfully so that they mm -hmm. would go forth and spread the message. Um I've been really taken with this song by Tyler Childers, um, Way of the Triune God. I you know, know this song? That. It says, give me that old time screaming and a shouting. Go up, tell it on the mountain. Faith too strong to be left uh, doubting. Way of the triune God. Brother, I don't need the uh, pills you take just to feel the spirit moving. I ain't slept in days all without the drugs you're using. And um, I, I was talking to, to Paul about this because he came from a charismatic Christian sect. And I was like, there's actually a lot of embodied power in that kind of Christianity. Um, the music, the dancing, it, they, they get how that creates spirit but it's also um it's very very prone to abuse yeah well because it's emotional yeah. uh you know that's why liturgical christianity is very careful not to rely on on emotions too much so mm -hmm. if you go like if you go to an orthodox church you'll have an increase in focus that's what happens in the liturgy as you move, there's a desire to attend. There's a call to attend that moves into the sacrament of communion, where you eat. You know, if you knew what was what was going on, eating the blood and body of the incarnate God is is right up there with jumping in thirty <laughs> feet down into cold water. Now, the the difficulty is that some people take that for granted. But if you didn't take it for granted, you'd realize that. The mystery that you are, the, the the kind of tremble that you should have when you approach that mystery, uh, is one which is uh, existentially should be equal or way or more than than the, that type of situation, uh, and and it's not an emotional thing, it's not it it can have emotional effect on you like you obviously you see people cry after communion or you know it, it happened to me sometimes but it's the 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 type of transformation it's supposed to bring about is not limited to emotion you could say that it, mm -hmm. it's it's more ontological yeah there's a you know i've been i've been to the orthodox church a few times and there's a way in which it feels very it doesn't it doesn't It feels like a shadow for me of mm -hmm. the things that I've experienced that were really powerful for me. You know, it does. It it feels like, like I get the symbolism of the of communion, right? I haven't taken communion because I haven't committed, and it hasn't felt appropriate to try to take communion without having that commitment. But like, it feels like I see that symbolically and ritualistically as like yeah it makes a lot of sense and at the same time i feel like there's a way in which modern frame... you have to go to confession <laughs> you uh, go to confession and you go to communion if you really go to confession uh 
you you go through the water, man. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, obviously, I don't. I don't want to be careful. I don't go to conf. I don't go to confession every time I go. To, I take communion, yeah. but you know, I try to have regular confession. Confession is a, it's an intense thing, man. Yeah, I mean, I I I understand that. I've we've I've ended up. You know, I think that like a lot of these emergent practices, they kind of um, they they access some of the same things. Yeah, right? I know there there are people develop confession type uh, yeah. things. I've seen it with like men's groups and stuff. Like people mm -hmm. will have a type of of uh, confession type behavior with the with each other, and it. And it, I mean, it is helpful. Like, yeah. you, you know, if you've done it, that if you're in a position of trust with someone and you're able to kind of to, to reveal yourself uh, in those that most vulnerable uh, space, it's it's it can be healing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I suppose that I want to shift gears a little bit and go back to something else, because one of I said one of the things that I one of the things that I actually love about Christianity is the sense that it that when you when I hear it from you, right? And I hear it from Paul and Paul and Meitner, and when I when I think about the Christian the Celtic saints and stuff, I see this deep respect for embodiment that isn't in the Buddhist vision of escape, that isn't in gnostic spirituality and we're all energy deepak chopra right it's like no the incarnation matters and that really like that really rings for me because like that's my big message is we are bodies right mm -hmm. we, we are this and uh, and i i've seen so much spiritual bypassing from that idea of we are you know spiritual beings having a physical experience it's like no that, yeah, that doesn't yeah. work and it doesn't work for me scientifically epistemologically and it doesn't work for me in my experience so it's like i see that and i see that that there has been a time when Christianity called us to a greater relationship to nature. You know, you see that in the Christian in the Celtic saints. Mm -hmm. um, but the Christianity that I grew up with was a Christianity that viewed us not as stewards of the garden, but as uh, as 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 dominators, right? As, as it's all ours to do with as we please, mm -hmm. and that that has that really scarred me you know that's something that that is really antithetical to to what i believe in and i think that it's it's you know it's it's it is also sort of what's happening within transhumanism this idea of total subjugation of nature and even at arc i still feel like you know there's a bit of I, that you know there's some of that right like it's 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 energy in the environment but it's really just energy here Right. There's, there's no, there's no discussion of that. And so I had a really, I went to the energy, of the environment dinner. And afterwards I ended up talking to Brett Weinstein and Heather Hine. And we had this really, really beautiful and deep conversation. And we, uh, we, you know, couldn't stop talking for like two hours afterwards. And, and Brett was saying, there was a point in the art, in the argument where I started moving theologically, if that makes sense, right? We were talking about men and women and, and, you know, how we view sex differences from a biological perspective, but we got into how do we, how do we conceive our relationship to the natural world and what, how do we do that well? And is that being done well at ARC? Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to escape the environmental apocalypse that, that says that human beings are a cancer on the earth and really we're just better off getting rid of them. Yeah. But it feels like there's this other place where it's like, actually nature only matters in its relationship to human well-being. And Brett, you know, is very resistant, <laughs> resistant to religion. And he was saying that the, that, that the guys who are on the table, Alex Epstein and Michael Schellenberger and Dennis Prager, they're more right than the environmental apocalyptics, but they just don't, they haven't, they haven't gone far enough in their perspective. They need to think about human well-being, human thriving on a longer time scale. And then mm -hmm. if you think about human thriving on a long enough time scale that you recover, that you need to save the orcas. And I, 
I was like, I don't think that's the case. I don't, I don't, because it depends on how you define human thriving. Yeah. And I think that the Alex Epstein types, they wouldn't define human thriving as being contingent on orca whales in the slightest. But I think that actually the Christian story tells us that we need to be stewards of the, of, of nature, right? Something like that is actually what we need. We need a transcendent good that we are subject to that guides us to an understanding that we have to, that we should be oriented towards a kind of zero sum game towards the natural or sorry, a positive sum game towards the natural world. Just as we're called to love, you know, as we're called to love our enemies, including the lions, right? That that's sort of my perspective on it. And I, I feel like the work that I do and, and, and that it, it it's, it's about recovering that relationship to the environment. But this was something that I saw in McGilchrist too, that he was, it felt like he was pointing to that. It's like to recover the, the right brain perspective and that sense of respect for nature. We need to go back to something that has, well, as you said, we, we are collapsing towards religion, whether we like it or not, or it's, it's reemerging whether we like it or not. But that is one of my core questions about ARC and what's being organized there and about these different spaces is I, uh, I walk through the park and people leave their bags of dog poop everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I see that all the time. It's annoying. You know? I don't that I want to understand that. I want to understand the psychology that's conscientious enough to bring the back. Pick it up and leave it there. And like the, just leave the poop on the ground. And then and it's like, it I'll just leave this here. Like you don't think about the plastic and the environment. I know it's weird. That that's a weird I know I know that's the weirdest thing because you think it'd be it'd be less weird to just leave the poop on the ground because at least so it'll much go less into the ground. damaging to the environment. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh but so I think you're right. You know, the, the image of the final image, the final cosmic image in the book of Revelation, which reveals kind of like the end of everything, is, is a tree and a river, right? The mm -hmm. tree of life and the water of life at the center of a city. And so it's like that. And then around the, 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 the is where technology is. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that in some ways, technology is an increase of that natural world, uh, but it's an increase that doesn't uh, oppose it, right? It doesn't yeah. destroy it. it. It understands its place. And I think that that's, um, that's definitely a problem, a, a problem of balance that we, we don't seem to be able to find. Um, we either see ourselves as subjugators, completely subjugators, you know, or controllers. Sometimes it's not just subjugating, it's actually yeah. controlling. Because environmentalism is very similar because mm -hmm. all they want to do is control. They want to quantify how much water, they want to tag all the all the things, and they want to know like how much how much CO2 is being is, is so they want to act so even though they don't want to dominate the way that we but they want to they want to account for and control the natural world, which is a bad direction to go. It's it's the difference of the wild. Like there has to be, uh, an a, there has to be an affordance for the wild and and a, and a kind of uh, messiness, right? Uh, the messiness of nature and and the so it's very difficult to find that balance with the current with the current uh, approach. You know, the, the environmental apocalyptic vision. All it, it ends up being tyrannical towards nature. Oh yeah, because you can't allow nature to change. So, um, my my understanding of this, and I did do a lot of research on this. I don't know what the most recent research is, but red wolves are a supposed species of wolf that we actually have spent an enormous amount of money to try to defend by killing coyotes that come into their region because they'll breed with coyotes, and so we want to preserve their That's gene hilarious. against the the reality of interbreeding and it turns out that red wolves are just coyote wolf hybrids that's that's how they that's what they've always been that's basically. what they've always been right so what's so they'll probably that, move between coyotes and and wolves like just constantly until at some point they're 
really something that that, yeah. that is its own thing yeah well the the kind of wolf pattern let's say is not nearly as adaptive to living near human beings mm. and so uh on the east coast a lot of wolves have ended up hybridizing with 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 coyotes and they seem to be more adaptable because they take advantage of a niche that's in the environment um, mm -hmm. for hunting deer that coyote aren't really big enough to do right and with the wolves gone the koi wolves can do that but they but they're smaller and they're more flexible behaviorally and they're better at hiding and they don't yes, go after some of the things they won't either menace or feel uh, yeah. competition with humans and so they they adapt they it's a, it's an adaptive movement within within dog like animals yeah you create an animal that that's that hits in between the values of the coyote and the and the wolf in some sense and i understand like wolves are way sexier than than coyotes it's pretty cool to have like wolves around um but but at the same time it's like that's actually how nature works and has always worked right yeah like you and i are two percent neanderthal right and it's all over and and when we try to constrain nature we're actually unnaturing nature in a way yeah so you know the, the whole thing about a garden right is you can't you know i don't like i don't like traditional french gardens you like the english gardens like i like english are, gardens yeah, right. right you you're trying to create space in which the thing can unfold in and of itself and yeah yeah i agree I, I i french gardens are 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 also quite uh my own i think they're probably a much later thing like they're kind of like mm -hmm. baroque you know high high uh <laughs> monarchy you know it's like, the garden of the rational mind right? right like they come from uh, i don't know this but i suspect that they come from the point in intellectual history at which the cult of reason is rising yeah, I think so. I mean, th these really manicured gardens definitely in French culture seem to to come out of, uh, you know, Louis the Fourteenth type, you know, absolute monarchy, rationalism, all that stuff that 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 was at the outset of the. I might be wrong, but I'm. I think I think that's probably the case. Yeah. I have a sense that we've come towards the close of our conversation for today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this was right. it was good. It was great to talk to you, Rafe. I wish you the best, and with all those questions, like you, I think there's still things you need to kind of work out. Like I would say that, you know, the one thing that kind of made me a little pull back is, you know, the uh, I would be careful though, even though it is true that when we say church, we mean ecclesia, like a, a gathering. But I would be careful, just a little careful with the language in the sense that. You know, and even the ritualization, like be attentive to what happens with that, because there are such things as cults, you know, those yeah, things oh yeah. happen. Very, very, right? very conscious of that. Like cults happen, you know. Right. Yeah, that was one of the things that came up with, uh, with like, as I brought up charismatic Christianity is we. Charismatic Christianity shares a lot of common features with the kind of uh, new age movement that I experienced growing up. And they both suffer from this, this, uh, this tendency to create charismatic leaders yeah. who are really able to move people through the power of emotion and like create spirit, but who haven't been truly trained into like ethics and moral education. Mm. Um, and so like every time that we take a step towards like people will come to us and they they tell us that the, what they like is the transformative impact of what we're doing. Like they, like the the jumping over things is great, but um, they want they're they're responding to something that's more than the skill in physicality that they're growing. Mm -hmm. And every time that we've done that, that we've accepted sort of okay, we can we can lean into that power a little bit more. We can have some music at the event. We can we can uh, we can do this kind of opening ceremony and closing ceremony to to recognize the container that we've created at every step i'm always like be careful yeah yeah, yeah. be careful because be careful. Yeah. because because i uh yeah so i'm very strategic actually about trying to separate it out and i 
I, um, you know, within Evolve Move Play, I have this, this idea that fundamentally, if we want to solve the meaning crisis, we need to address five relationships that the individual agent has to the world. One relationship is the relationships internal to the self. So we can think of that structurally, how well does your shoulder communicate with your hip and somatically. When your shoulder's tight, what does that actually mean emotionally? Mm -hmm. And the next relationship is um, the relationship of the self to the world as a landscape. How powerfully and virtuously can you move through the world? And then the relationship of the world as a set of objects that you can do, that you can, you are a tool using animal. How do you grow in that? And then there's the relationship of the self to other agents. And that is embodied in rough and tumble play and wrestling and dance. And then it, it rises up into philosophy and dialogical practice. And then the last level is respect for the, is, is the relationship to the transcendent. We exist within powers and principalities. How do we worship correctly, right? How do we lend ourselves into worship? And I'm very, very clear that EMP is sort of non-denominational, right? As we get to the level of saying, hey, there is a transcendent aspect. We're, we, we can do these rituals and stuff, but we're not going to make any metaphysical claims around these rituals. Mm -hmm. We're going to say to people, this is something that you need to go seek. And we want, you know, I want that people can say, this is helping me in my Christianity or this is helping my Buddhism. This is helping my, uh, um, Islam, right? I think that respecting those first four relationships and being able to grow in virtuosity there is very powerful but where it suffers the danger that you you allude to or that you point out is in that last component that's where incredible uh caution is necessary yeah well it's great and so you know one day i'll have to come and see what you're doing let's do it let's do it um that'd be really fun okay yeah i will uh I will I will close the recording for now. All right. All right, it's good to talk Thank to you, Nathan. Man.